Hey everyone, uh, we have Sumit Kumar Singh here uh, to talk about revolution of tech and music. Sumat, Sumit Kumar Singh is a seasoned product management management leader and a coach. He has built various products for the Indian and Indonesian internet ecosystem. Besides a tech enthusiast, he is also a musician and can play more than 30 musical instruments. He's done a TED talk called Sounds of Earth on rare music instruments from different cultures such as uh, Ridi Grido, uh, Mouth Heart, Shakuchi and Native American flutes. He loves to compose his own music and off late he has been exploring the digital audio workstations and electronica. Today he'll be taking us on a trip down memory lane and trace the evolution of music technology and how it's going to shape the future. Uh, over to you, Sumit. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. And hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from whichever part of the world you're tuning in. I hope uh, this is going to be a bit of a detour uh, from all this typical uh, you know, the, the, the stuff, the themes that we have. And thanks to uh, Yui for giving me this particular uh, topic. I wasn't too sure if uh, I should be doing this particular topic or if I actually be, you know, uh, doing a talk at all in the Be More Festival. But she really pushed me to come up with something. And this is the reason why this particular topic came up. And very excited to be here. Thank you so much, ADP Liz, for putting together this festival. And just so amazing to see 24 hours and just so many amazing speakers doing such solid discussions so uh, you know kudos to uh, to the team working tirelessly behind this idea um, so getting started with it guys uh, a brief history of time uh, and time here means the time signature of music uh, for the uninitiated ones but let's get started on uh, this i'll uh, i'm breaking the the thing today in three sections largely we have uh, first part, which I'll probably skip through, you know, quickly is largely the history of how uh, various inventions came in and how they kind of moved the market. I'll touch upon some bit of financials of how the revenues of the music industry labels have looked like before moving into the next phase of it, which is where a lot of tech evolved, um, how the web evolved, how the consumer space and also the production and distribution space evolved in that and you know ending towards with a, a thought around how uh, the current state of technology is going to impact the you know the, the future and uh, the life of musicians and for anyone who's a music enthusiast so with that let's get let's get started um, in case if my you know my speed is not okay in case if uh, the audio is patchy please uh, you know, put your comments in the q and I'm sure Sandeep will look into it and I can always rewind. I don't really want you to miss out on uh, the content. So if there is anything you want me to fix, give me a feedback and uh, a quick show of hands, guys. Uh, if you are, uh, if this audio is okay, uh, quick thumbs up in the reactions. Awesome. I see a few. Thank you so much. So with that, let's get started. Uh, so what you see here is a phonograph, 1877 is probably the first instrument ever, uh, you know, which did record any audio of any kind. So if you look at it in the hindsight, uh, we're talking about uh, the recorded music history is actually not even 150 years old. The first recording actually did happen on 1877 and then the recorded uh, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb was uh, the first one. Uh, the first poem that they actually did record on this. And this was essentially just a, a steel cylinder which had vibrations posted on, you know, uh, iron oxide, and that's typically how they uh, they did it. Um, moving on, the same concept then from a cylinder, uh, they picked up into a vinyl, not a vinyl disc, but on a phonograph. It was basically a cylinder with a particular needle that came in. Uh, 1925. So 1877 to a couple of others, they, they did have various variations of the recorder, which was a cylinder, uh, using various other different materials. And in 1925, they came up with the Victrola phonograph, which was essentially a, kind of a vinyl, but uh, a cylindrical horizontal surface to, to record a few of these audio signals, and then they moved on. Same concept, you know, iron oxide with a needle, and then they tried to record a few of these vibrations on that. But this again was, as you would imagine, not a very friendly thing. It kind of became a luxury item for people to, to really have. So only the Lukes and the Riches actually had, uh, you know, this kind of a setup before the magnetic tapes came in 1928. And these essentially became the de facto uh, the storage device for the longest time, even for even till today. Uh, you know, the, the real quality 
restoration or archives of the tapes that really happen happens on a magnetic tape. So if you go into any of your radio studios uh, archivals, you will see these loads of uh, really big mounts of magnetic tapes uh, storing tons and tons of audio there. So that's the, you know that's that that came in 1928. Uh, moving a few fast forward, uh, the LPs came in 1931, which is basically uh, where all the Metallicas of the worlds and the Bollywoods of the world did you know put in a lot of their audio and uh, amazing store you know shelf life they did. I still remember we, we we have a lot of LPs back in the days. Uh, still, they must be stacked somewhere in the house, which uh, has tons of memories attached to it. So uh, we had the, the players that were doing uh, these LPs, they were actually playing around with Sonodyne and a couple of other brands. But, uh, you know, LPs were one of the def one of those particular medias of music, which actually did contribute a lot to the musical industry. A lot of companies did come in and they started doing it. Um, again, it was cumbersome to store. It was difficult to manage, fragile some bits of it, and uh, only the riches would typically, you know, uh, keep it. Till we did come up with a tape recorder in 1935. It's called AEG because the company that actually started off with a magnetophone tape recorder was uh, the first of its device which could actually record a, an audio signal in a very uh, B2C setting. And this was also the stereo device. Uh, which uh, you know, for, for the longest time we were playing around with uh, a mono signal, but uh, somewhere between those two uh, paradigms, somebody did figure out a stereo signal, and then the tape recorder started to play in a four-track signal, uh, which did produce an audio uh, thing. So it was in 1935 that you actually saw these magnetic uh, tapes moving into a recorder, which eventually did bring the entire for, you know paradigm shift to from a vinyl to the cassettes. This used to really rein the market for the longest time. You could imagine, you could remember even uh, moving into a, you know, a music store, so it could be Radio City or a hit factory music store to really go and buy a cassette when, as and when the particular cassette tapes were recorded uh, and released. Uh, people would actually line up in front of uh, these uh, you know, stores uh, again, one of those really revenue-hitting uh, product that shaped the mass uh, market. Uh, so coming from the cylinders to the big vinyls to now cassette, you imagine how the technology moved and it made it more uh, affordable, made it more disposable and also portable at the same time, wherein you could actually move around. But what really moved the needle was the invention of a Walkman in 1979, which really made this whole... Uh, the whole nuance of portable music and you could carry around your music as in when you move around in 1979. Otherwise, people were carrying those big stereo boxes, you know, tons of these uh, Hollywood movies that you would remember uh, shows people moving around with those really big uh, stereo devices. But that really shrunk into your pocket. Now you can move around with a Walkman. And the next version of it was essentially... Uh, you know, a, a CD man, which is in 1982 when the compact discs came and it really changed the paradigm to uh, for not being able to store a lot of songs, only 10 to 12 songs being played on, uh, you know, one side of uh, on, on both sides of a track and a cassette to now you were able to store about 150 to 200 songs on a compact disc and kind of, you know, being able to move that forward. Uh, but again, CDs were good. They were, you could really store a lot of it. And I actually remember buying a 500 stack of CDs back in my days um, when, you know, we, we really wanted to actually own a lot of CDs and people could actually, you know, burn CDs uh, with your own set of songs till about uh, the time when the worldwide, you know, the worldwide web actually come into existence. So while the, the, the TCP IP protocol did come in 1983, but it was only till about 1989 when uh, British computer scientist Sir Tim Berners actually drafted the proposal to ease the virtual communication protocol. And in fact, actually, it was in 1993 that the first browser did come up and that actually opened the floodgates for endless uh, possibilities, one of which was the MP3 technology. Uh, so people were able to actually not connected but somewhere connected around the same time in 1991 when the first 
uh, you know, the first ter terminology of MP3 was actually coined. This was in 91. But then they actually did try around with different bit rates. They were trying to play with how a particular track from a four track to an eight track would actually sound from a 119600 uh, kilohertz to a 44,000 kilohertz. And only in 1995 is when the .mp3, uh, you know, as a format was selected and cemented with a 44,000 kilohertz. And then the whole Walkman and the CDman did crunch into your pocket as a small MP3 player, uh, which you could really play around with carrying up to about 1,000, uh, you know, tracks um, uh, in, in your pocket. Almost the same time as the World Wide Web was being kind of, you know, getting more popularity, it was becoming more... Uh, you know, consumer friendly, it was more commercialized at the same, almost a similar same time we did. And this kind of hits you in, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people uh, show me your hand, show me, you should give me a heart, give me a thumbs up or how many of you did actually play around on a Vinamp? I, I really want to see uh, how many of you, uh, this, this one product, I'm kind of very, very confident that one of the long, longest lasting product right from 1977, all the way till uh, 2022 is in fact uh, it's only now December 20 uh, 2022 is when they have finally decided to shut down Winamp. The earlier versions were like really trashy looking, uh, but really you know solving the problem statement of playing really amazing music. So Winamp essentially was a Windows based uh, uh, you know uh, audio media protocol. Uh, or an amplified media protocol was essentially a Windows based player and that really moved the needle for a lot of people wherein you would have a CD, you could come in a lot of songs and you put in a CD, play it on Winamp. Um, I'm not sure how many of you would remember, you know, getting a lot of uh, the screens for your Winamp and you, people could download screens, people could actually download codecs and in fact it was around uh, I think it was around 2008 when the Shoutcast um, was launched as one of the codecs and that actually allowed people to stream the music that they were playing on their Winamp to other listeners. I remember when I was in I am Lucknow in 2008-2010, I actually set up the first radio station on the LAN using Winamp and Shoutcast stream and which actually played music 24-7. So anybody who wanted to hear music from any part of the campus could just click a particular URL and that's where we had this particular radio station with over about thousand songs uh, being playing, you know, being played continuously. So that essentially did open up a lot of ideas around streaming and uh, radio, etc, uh, etc, et which, um, you know, which, which really uh, moved the consumer market uh, in, a, in a big way. Almost the same time as we were looking at you know copying songs via cds and cassettes and playing them on windows did come the big daddy of all sharing apps napster i mean you know, hail the lords napster did really open up uh, the industry in in so many ways it wasn't just about p2p sharing it was actually a lot about democratizing the way people did explore music from different parts of the world and you could just download tons and tons of music. I mean, guilty as charged. I also did use Napster a lot. I explored a lot of my, you know, fusion music, um, some some Afro with the Spanish music, uh, some Native American to electronic art, some Indian fusion. A lot of people did. Uh, and that actually did allow people to experiment with sounds. It allowed people to compose music in their own uh, you know, in their fancy recordings and just upload it on Napster and allow people to really just, uh, you know, be able to read and listen into music and get inspired. So Napster did actually, you know, uh, in, uh, opened up a lot of floodgates. So what really happened, you know, just to take a step back here, for the longest time, we had these vinyls, which contributed to a lot of uh, revenue. Then we had the cassettes, which also contributed to the revenue because people would go to a store, buy cassettes and buy these vinyls. Now came Napster and it actually opened up a lot of, uh, you know, the floodgates on internet and that actually did um, involve a lot of piracy, yes, but uh, uh, for the larger good of humankind, I think it, it was a boon, uh, uh, it was a blessing uh, in disguise uh, and it just really helped us as musicians and music enthusiasts to, to really, you know, experience a lot of music. But then the, the revenue of uh, the music industry did go down. Here's a small snapshot of how 
the revenue looked like you know before Napster uh, get launched and after Napster got launched. So for the longest time, you know, we, we, we've seen a long tail. If you see the left curve, which is the physical sales happening, and then came the launch of Napster and the sales really did go down till about iTunes got, got launched. It's only in about 2015, 17, if you see the towards the last end of uh, the, the, you know, of uh, the chart is when you actually see a, a growth happening there. So a lot of content creators are now starting to create music and then, you know, the mashables are coming up and people are exploring and experimenting with a lot of uh, very original ideas. Not to say that a lot of, you know, a lot of indie music artists are actually creating music on the go and, uh, you know, public, uh, uh, publishing their music. And it's not much of a, uh, revenue that is actually being contributed by the labels per se, but just independent artists actually are also kind of, you know, doing a lot of stuff and the whole NFTs are only going to make it better. But that's for the future. So let's take a step back here. Let's come back to what really. So we saw on the consumer side, let's take a, you know, just change the paradigm a little. Let's look at what was actually happening on the production side. This is Abbey Road Studio in London, one of the famous studios which Beatles used to record a lot of their music. In fact, this is a picture from the Beatles uh, studio itself and the, the photograph was colorized later. Uh, uh, the real estate, as you can imagine, the number of people playing their instruments, you can imagine the kind of setup, the audios, the, the RJ45 cables and whatnot, the monitors. So just running the show for a studio was so capital intensive. It actually took a lot of time for people to figure out how to make their entire uh, model, the whole uh, model of making music and then eventually generating revenue uh, a bit sizable. But then post Napster, post iTunes kind of you know, uh, took a step back. And uh, somewhere around the same time to solve for all of these problems, Pro Tools came in 1991. Uh, and, and one of the, the, lead, the leaders clearly. And then came um, 1997 was Cubase. And uh, 90s for auto tune, which actually did help slicing and dicing and actually uh, setting the right pitch for all the instruments. And then Cubase came in 1989, which did bring in all the capabilities of auto tune and Pro Tools into a very nice looking, uh, you know, uh, uh, a setup. And something, sometime around the same lines, what was happening is that because we did see the web coming up and we did see the consumer space going up, a lot of these tools eventually did also get exported to the consumer side. So they started playing around with uh, a lot of, uh, you know, these kind of digital audio workstations as DAO, as we call it in the music industry. So Fruity Loops came in 1998, one of the most simplistic ways of creating digital sounds. Uh, very simple sequencers, you can just play uh, whatever sounds you want. And uh, this is one of the, 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 the latest versions of Fruity Loops. I remember playing with the first, second version of Fruity Loops. And in fact, till about nine, 2015, I was playing with the FL Studio as they, they kind of you know, converted. So I had tons of these racks and condensers and stuff. And you could just play around and synthesize a lot of sound um, and actually release. So what happened is you this particular studio setup that was there and actually with, with tons of uh, these mixers and panels and 148 channels and whatnot with big sound systems did eventually converge all the way to this. Today, people can actually compose their music on a digital audio workstation with a very basic minimalistic setup at the comfort of their home uh, with some basic condenser mics and stuff, and they don't really need to go uh, to a big studio. In fact, today, all the OTT channels that uh, you see, uh, most of these web series uh, that are being done, their audio is done inside of a room studio. Uh, Dolby Atmos uh, Home Edition is what uh, is basically powering uh, tons of uh, these revolutions uh, for production, uh, you know, engineers and stuff. Uh, they don't need to really go, except for if you want to do a Spielberg kind of a production, then you need to go and look at the 7.1 and 5.1 channel surround systems. But um, that's, that's basically uh, it. Uh, you know, tons of your otherwise retail uh, music, which is being used in you know, e-gaming or in an OTT is all done in, in, in this kind of a setup. Somewhere on the same lines, right? Uh, in 2001, when actually iPod and iTunes uh, come out, this really did change the way people played around with. So MP3 was there, of course, but then when iTunes came in, they realized that the format that Apple was using for uh, 
playing uh, their uh, audio system was far richer in uh, in the fidelity so they really were a hi-fi audio system which they did have a proprietary tool called ipod so they used tons of ipod to be able to do it and what they also did at the same time is that they gave garage band in 2004 so people could just open up their mac uh, books compose high quality audio signals and actually play it all inside of an iPod and iTunes and can even distribute it. So I, for the longest time, uh, iTunes became, you know, did become the de facto default of distributing music uh, over the web, except if there was Napster and then they did file a case on Napster for piracy and blah, 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 till Spotify come in 2006 and Spotify did move the entire thing over the web, they they kind of you know solved the last mile problems with the, the legal and other things, and they really opened up. And today, Spotify, you know how how they how they really you know moving up the value chain. So so this is all that's happening in a distribution. So you can today going forward. In fact, with five G coming in, you don't even need to have an app. You'll probably be able to just stream everything from the cloud. So uh, that that's that's basically where we're moving to. And all along, as the production is happening, we, we have tons of this, and the, the size of uh, the studio is kind of going down. Then came Novation Launchpad in 2009, and what you see is actually a proper studio setup. You don't need fancy, huge, uh, you know, uh, huge uh, mics and stuff. Of course, you need a condenser mic to get the right kind of quality, but you can do as well with a with a normal mic. In fact, the Bluetooth caller mics these days are as good as a condenser mic these days and you're able to kind of you know plug uh, play along with it that's actually the setup that i use at home uh, to play along um, so then came the mobile at the same time and a lot of these apps that you saw were actually being desktop oriented they also see uh, some some kind of nuances building into the mobile app so this is a novation launchpad and i have a small demo for you guys uh, i hope you like it let me know if you're able to hear the audio signal from my side Give me a thumbs up if you're able to hear it. So what I'm doing is I'm superimposing my, from my phone, I'm playing this live. So all the stuff that you hear right now is all being played live using all the various signals. And I'm playing a Native American drone flute on the electronica. was a sample uh, that's typically where the, the the consumer space has actually gone up and uh, i hope you like that um, th thanks for all the, um, the the reactions coming in so so with technology you know really shrinking down into your pockets it's really an expression of yourself uh, it's really being democratized you can carry your instruments along wherever you want to um, something 
it's a it's a liano which a cork which is a company which makes tons of these amazing synthesizers i've just made as a portable piano so if you don't really have to carry the big one 88 keys is really nice which uh, people are able to kind of you know do going forward the expression was a challenge so there's a new product in the in the in the market called roly seaboard you can create tons of expressions play drum beats on the same thing you don't need any other instrument whatsoever just a laptop and a seaboard and you are actually able to synthesize studio quality music uh, all inside of it and as I, I told you dolby atmos home edition is what the technology which is actually powering all of these 7.1 systems but that's not it that's not all that technology is doing right this is just the stuff that we see around production and consumer space and stuff the real deal that's actually moving wherein the synthesis and the computers and the tech is coming forward the whole ai and ml is coming forward is is really where we are moving into this realm of uh, neuro feedbacks this is called the music brain computer interface bci and the musical neuro feedback is the framework that we typically talk about here is sefi udi a young paraplegic guy who's actually playing a live track for the audience in one of the, uh, the events that happened in Tel Aviv some time back. And there is this guy called uh, Matt Knapp, who is uh, the scientist, who is a professor, who is doing a ton, so tons of this research in that particular area. He's making air instrumentable, which is a wearable motion control instrument. So imagine folks with autism and a couple of other uh, you know disabilities, they're able to control and play music using just their hand. And they're able to tune it. You can actually do tons of other stuff. He also did make this whole musical hat, which is a prototype for a wearable music instrument used as a live looper with audio effects which respond to your head movements, which actually reads your EEG and translates electrical activity in the brain into music. And you're able to create tons of those loops just by thinking about it on the excitement level and stuff. He even did create another prototype. I don't have a photograph of that wherein he actually did go ahead and allow a person completely sitting in a wheelchair to be able to play music using just his eye movements. Uh, so that's that, you know, I believe is where the world is moving to. Uh, that I believe is where the world and the whole technology is making music so accessible and inclusive to everyone uh, going forward and the possibilities of being able to create music on the fly, uh, making the world more inclusive as a space uh, and the whole expression of how people actually you know uh, consume music and uh, produce music and they're actually able to produce uh, tons of their expressions and express themselves in ways in which we are not able to um, you know just realize it uh, so much more so i think uh, the future of music industry really lies uh, so much so much brighter with all of this uh, coming in and with that uh, i close the session thank you so much everyone i hope you enjoyed it Uh, so maybe like the Sumit, I'm not sure also if the timeline, uh, like to think about, like I was born in an era, like after the privacy, uh, like the piracy thing interrupted the music, uh, industry. So I get to see like a lot of the apps that you mentioned, like, uh, I haven't uh, a specific experience with it. So, yeah, I think we can, uh, quickly get onto the, uh, Q and a part. Okay. And, uh, we have got some questions. Okay. How will music creation shift in the future with that integration of AI? So recently people are talking about the dolly, right? Uh, like creating the portraits and that has gone, uh, gone to win awards as well. So how this would, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. oh, there is uh, you should definitely check out this, uh, Amazon, uh, deep, uh, uh, deep crafter. And then there is another uh, Google AI, AI uh, uh, library called, uh, magenta. Uh, you should definitely check it out, Claudia. Uh, you you are able to speak it out and and sing a play a few notes and the the library actually is able to compose the entire uh, symphony out of it so you can have in you it basically understands the time if you are playing it on a four by four or a five by seven it reads and understands the notation that you are playing creates a scale out of it puts the bass line puts a synth line gets your drums there is it, the you know the future of ai being able to create in fact there was another project same by MATLAB uh, is uh, with there was a person, there's a person who's actually playing keyboard. He's a right handed person and his left hand is not really doing too well. So he's playing the major notes on the right hand side 
and he's able to play a few notes on the left but then the 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 ai generator essentially understands how he's playing and what notes is he playing the way he's composed it and it actually corrects all the stuff that he's playing with the left and even if it kind of you know goes goes off a little so the, there is just tons of stuff that's happening uh, in the in, in the ai space in music uh, for sure i hope that answered yeah i definitely uh, that's a uh, beautiful resource as well to check out so are the question from rajesh have you ever created ui sounds by yourself with your own equipments oh yes tons of it ui sounds what do you mean by ui sounds rajesh i'm not sure but yeah i do compose my I own believe... stuff so this is another instrument that i do uh, you know i just give you so yeah i i, I compose a lot of uh, this stuff rajesh i hope that that question was around that i'm not sure if i answered in what the yeah, question I, i think like he's talking about the uh, interaction sounds right that when you click on a button like it makes a pop sound or when you open a navigation like even in mobiles the keypad tones so those are some to my understanding those are you oh, yeah. sounds Yes, so I often use my own sounds in my uh, in my presentations. So, okay. um, you know, we have tons of these. Soundforge is one of those uh, platforms that I use to uh, edit my tracks and then kind of do my sound engineering on top of it. So, so if you want to check out Soundforge, is uh, is the place to go. And yeah, we have one one question around uh, Web three space. Uh, how will the current ownership methods morph into the space of Web three when it comes to music ownership? and the role oh this is a great question mark thank you so much for the question this is this is one of the most debated uh, realm right now uh, that is actually happening and i'm i'm hoping that with blockchain coming in with nfts coming in that people will actually get their due credit uh, for uh, all the stuff that they are really creating uh, with metaverse coming in it's even more exciting and the more the organizations adopt to metaverse and uh, with uh, with new forms of uh, new channels rather new you know of, of distributions that will typically come in i i i'm hopeful that a lot of indie musicians and artists will actually get their due labels uh, and royalty for all the music that they are playing and blockchain will essentially help them uh, reach re, you know re, reach that milestone and sumit i i do have a question like you showed me the graph right like for the labels uh, revenue after like uh, like going in nose dive deep um like yeah. it's yeah when the digital took off so how do you think like for the the physical instruments that we have right so how is the fall in yeah. in terms of like manufacturing in terms of uh, adaptability let's say like if i wanted to learn uh, people will directly switch to uh, some digital instruments like the seaboard you showed us so thinking that is the future i yeah. start with seaboard instead of learning one instrument i can learn multiple instruments in yeah. one uh, technical technical thing like what's your thought on that correct That's a great question, Sandeep. And I've been a musician who's actually learned in the era when YouTube never existed. So I did actually go pick up books and took lessons from people, uh, explored the uh, the nuances of playing an instrument, the expressions and the bends. And guitar used to is one of my favorite instruments that I play. When I try and bring those nuances in a keyboard or an electronic, I often find it very difficult and challenging to have the same kind of expression. in 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 electronic uh, sense unless if my keyboard becomes so responsive when i'm pressing it hard when i'm pressing it slow the speed with it take there are just so many uh, you know so many parameters that go in for producing a sound the pitch and the timbre of the instrument you change from a steel to a nylon you can do all of it in the in in in, in the realm of digital world by the click of a button but really playing it in the the joy that you get the vibrations that you get the the feel that you get i think uh while a lot of electronic musicians will eventually did come up as well and that's good for people good for industry but the the joy of feeling and the you know, being, being playing to be able to play the drums while dancing on the crown or being able to really do a headbang when you're on the stage that joy of playing real instruments is i, I don't think it's is going anywhere Mm, great um and also we have got one question from michael uh, what are your recommended tools for beginners wanting to make digital music so who wants to get into digital music so preferred tools yeah 
Um, I think GarageBand is a great tool to get started uh, if you are on Apple. Uh, otherwise, you can look at Fruity Loops for sure. FL Studio, it's a great one as well. Um, on mobile, you can definitely look at uh, Novation Launchpad. Uh, I was playing on a Launchpad uh, on, on mobile uh, device. So yeah, those two three can be good starting points. Yeah. So and also like uh, in terms of the digital uh, recording uh, thing. So how long does it take for an industries? to adopt to the uh, new changes let's say back in like in 1930s as you mentioned like they got the very first uh, the disc uh, type thing and it got like some more years to adopt to uh, industry right in terms of like commercializing it correct and what would be the future correct. type like now we have physical digital now and there is like web3 uh, sort of thing like owning their own things uh, coming up correct so how the adoptability uh, uh, rate would be to the industry Oh, so we've moved from in under ten years we moved from studio to Dolby to five point one to now seven point one channels, and today Apple is actually delivering spatial audio on these AirPods. Uh, my sense is that the adoptability curve, as with any other technology, and you also see the same thing happening in mobile as well. It's only getting shortened as we speak. So. Uh, and and that's you know and, and people do understand that if you don't change and adopt you'll probably be an incumbent and you'll probably be thrown out of the market so companies are actually adopting in a big way uh, and uh, being able to do some quick experimentations on the consumer space by launching an app seeing if it works or not and then rolling it back it just allow people to do quick tests which are not too commercial heavy and uh, with minimal investments you are actually able to get some first hand feedback so Uh, adoption is definitely going much much faster than what used to be back in the days and also it's just the whole awareness part of it right the tons of people who are talking about the new tech that is coming in uh, uh, so any new thing that is coming out people are able to distribute it globally so today we are sitting here in a you know in a 24 hour jam session with folks tuning in from across the globe this was not possible 10 years ago so uh, this is this is just unprecedented uh, and some exciting times to live in actually if you ask me and also we have one more question uh, i can show it on the stage yeah, your take on this how will the music tech look like in next 5 to 10 years in your opinion what is the next big thing um, i think uh, this this is an interesting one uh, i definitely see these big studios going out in fact hit factory is shut down some time back they've converted to a condominium Uh, radio city was looking forward to kind of sell their real estate as well so so that part of the concert is kind of going out the stadiums are going to double up as concert pieces uh your uh, music instruments electronica is definitely coming in i see tons of these cool kids doing some amazing music uh, in their school and they're actually creating their own youtube channels wherein they're doing tons of stuff uh, justin bieber was actually uh you know uh, discovered on youtube so uh, i i definitely see the future of next 5 years very exciting i hope by then in next 5 to 10 years they are able to figure out a potentially viable uh, revenue model because if you see otherwise musicians and artists are not really making a lot of money uh tons of money still goes to the distribution library like spotify and an it was it take almost like 40% of all the distribution charges so i i i hope we are able to figure out something around that side and uh, people are actually able to make viable you know career options out of music and not just in uh, sound engineering and back uh, you know backstage engineering but also as a as a musician and artist otherwise if you see an artist life is really small all the big artists that are coming today uh, each artist life is like hardly 5 years 10 10 years is an era people are now going stale in the 3 to 4 years people you know they're done and dusted uh, maximum they, they get like 10 hits and then they're out some new artists will come in with a new voice and a new uh, a new sign i mean I, i remember the days when acdc used to reign the market or black sabbath and metallica that was an era or the so was the era of udit narayan kumar sanu uh, sonu nigam today if you talk about arijit singh he's done he's almost done i don't see doing a lot of songs anymore and you know pardon me for folks who are tuning in from other parts of the world who are not familiar with the indian music circle but what i'm saying is that the the life of a musician and the shelf life of a musician or a vocalist uh, or an artist so to say is is extremely short lived uh, people want to really have uh, new 
uh, stuff coming up every now and then. Uh, so that I, I hope we are able to break in some more profitability in the next five to ten years to make it more viable. That's that that's that's what I can expect. But if you ask me for the how the future is, I think it's extremely nimble at this point in time. We're just uh, doing tons of uh, amazing stuff. We'll probably be able to create music freehand uh, without any instrument in our hand, just purely on the basis of your uh, expressions and uh, your your body movements. Great, great. Uh, thank you so much, Sumit, uh, for your uh, uh, insightful presentation and for the nostalgia nostalgia you have created here uh, among us. And uh, yeah, folks, like please uh, share your uh, feedback in the link I have shared in the chat. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Take care.